read most of the Hugo nominated novels that were in my um, eligibility window. That is books that weren't in series that I hadn't already started before world con itself started. I didn't get through them all before voting closed. And also I didn't got all the videos of them done before world con either. Hence this one being out well after the award ceremonies. Oh, well, Still, might as well finish what I started since we've gotten through October and my horror movie reviews for the month, for the year. Um, so let's do the video. So do video on the last of the books on my list. She Who Became the Sun by uh, Shelley Parker Chan, a novel inspired by wuxia fiction and um, also based on the rise of the Hongwu Emperor. It is a interesting book, but one to the few points that I stumbled over. Disclaimer, as I am not fluent in any dialect of Chinese and have some speech impediments to, that impact my ability to say certain phonemes, I apologize in advance for any names that I mispronounce. She Who Became the Sun follows the unnamed sister of Zhu Shengba, with said sister being the youngest daughter of a peasant family in a community struck by famine. Zhu Chengba is a fortune told that he would achieve in greatness and his sister would gain nothing. However... When bandits sack the village and kill their parents, Chung Ba succumbs to despair and dies, and his sister takes his name and identity and decides to claim her brother's destiny for herself. Consequently, for the rest of this review, I will be referring to her by her brother's name. Chung Ba starts by studying at a monastery, and when the monastery is then sacked by the forces of the Hu Emperor, she joins the rebel army seeking to overthrow the Mongols and ends up achieving further and further acclaim on the battlefield. The part of the book that works is basically everything around Chung Ba going to the monastery, joining the army, becoming a battlefield commander, and performing more and more cunning strategic victories while also trying to weather the political turmoil within the leadership of the rebellion. Or to put it another way, dodging swords and arrows from the front and knives from the back. That part is great. There's some light fantasy in this person's of the story, but it's ultimately a really good, intense political and military story that's told incredibly well. The problem is, is on the rather frequent occasions where the plot shifts to our B narrative, the Mongols, and the point of view characters within the Hue Imperial Court. And the problem being that the Mongols are written like a bad pastiche of House Greyjoy from Game of Thrones. The Hue and leadership positions as written in the book hold outright attempt to ideas like agriculture, road maintenance, and resource extraction to get the materials needed to make weapons and feed an army. Yes, I know that the Mongolian that uh, uh, Mongol culture was a nomadic culture, but also they're run, they're, you know, got a whole army. You got to arm them. That's kind of a thing you need to do. And you have to extract resources to do that, or at least tra or trade with people to get already made weapons or iron or steel or what have you. And also keep in mind, the real world Mongols had a, had a postal system, an incredibly well organized one, one of the most effective postal systems of its day. Hell, the peak period of the Silk Road, uh, where, where it was at its most traffic, trafficked, was under the Khanate. So clearly, the Khanate valued trade, because otherwise, the Silk Road would have been effectively an afterthought. If an author wrote orcs like this, fantasy orcs, they would, and justifiably, be accused of using racial stere racist stereotypes in their depiction of the culture, and that is a, and that's with a fantasy race that doesn't exist in, in reality. This is an author depicting a culture that is not their own, as Kelly Parker Chan is, um, sorry, um, Shelley Parker Chan, because that, as Shelley Parker Chan is Chinese American, or as Shelley Parker Chan is Chinese Australian, not. Golian background, and she's using racist these racist stereotypes. Even if this is something that's common to Wuxia literature, something that she cites as being one of her influences for this book, and it's something of a genre convention from that, so are orcs written as racial stereotypes, and those are justly criticized for very good reasons. As a person who, even before the, uh, the recent push for greater cultural awareness of the differences between, eight, between various Asian and East Asian cultures, in response to racist acts against Asian Americans in the United States and ethnic Asians elsewhere, 
I had already been trying to educate myself on the cultural differences between different Asian populations due to my enjoyment of Asian media from multiple countries, not whether it's anime and tokusatsu from Japan, action cinema, including wuxia films from Hong Kong, Korean suspense thrillers, martial arts films from Thailand, heavy metal music from Mongolia. I have tried to make an effort well before I'd even heard that this book existed to try and educate myself on the distances between these different cultures and how they've historically interacted. Um, through reading books about the history of these different cultures and their interactions to watching YouTube travelogues like the very, very well done episodes of Cloth Map by Drew Scanlon, where he goes to Mongolia. And I've tried to learn everything I can or as much as I can with the resources available to me. Now, and this is me not being a scholar. This is me not being an expert. This is me being a amateur. And even with that, I know enough about the history of the Mongolian Empire combined with contemporary power dynamics between China and Mongolia to cause this description of what the book describes as the Hu Dynasty to make me uncomfortable in ways that I don't believe are authorial intent. I don't believe that the author meant for us to take away that, to take this depiction of the Mongols as some critique of the wuxia genre by by leaning too far into stereotypes. Further frustrating is, well, Parker Chan is Chinese-Australian, not mainland Chinese. As I've mentioned in videos previously, if a mainland Chinese author under the current Chinese government, that is, as of this recording, the Xi Jinping government, if they were brought to work with fell into racist stereotypes of the Mongolian people that are encouraged by the Chinese government, that would be disappointing and unfortunate. But considering the Chinese government and the current Chinese government has destroyed the careers and in some cases also arrested and done criminal charges against high profile people, artists, um, actors, and so forth, who have committed the crime of simply not agreeing enough, never mind disagreeing with the government's official stance. Um, I wouldn't like it, but I'd understand that any such statements or acts of artistic expression are ultimately made under intense duress. Even if they received no explicit threats from the government, there is the implicit threat against them. Now, it's possible that Parker Chan has family in mainland China who could theoretically be retaliated against if she did not with the endorsed perspectives of the current government, Chinese government. So that is possible, but on the other hand, it's not the same. There is, it doesn't feel like there's a similar excuse there. Again, I could be mistaken, but it's that it's awkward it makes it awkward and it gives me a sense of discomfort of the unintentional variety. Um, and also to hand wave all of this in the sense of, oh, the author is Asian, so it's fine. Though that's not an accurate thing to say at all because there are different, because it, it, to make that statement as a actual argument would be committing the, sin, committing the sin of conflating East Asian cultures in general, conflating China, Korea, Japan, um, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and other countries in the area as well, all of which, they're not a monoculture, and they all have different histories, not just in terms of their own cultural background, but also in terms of how they these cultures have interacted with each other. Korea has had a history of very rot and... Um, um, tumultuous interactions with both China and Japan well, well before the Korean War um, and so forth and so on. And obviously, like, this novel is about a period where we're getting into those cultural interactions between Mongolia and China. And 
so that you have to approach it with that perspective in mind of where you're, you're dealing with a fiction of a work of fiction that is influenced by a culture by this this period of by this period of cultural interaction between these two nations and cultures and everything but also in turn everything that came after that and even for that matter within the political boundaries of china as a political entity it ha in turn has a whole slew of other ethnic of, of other cultures within it and some of them carry over there from their neighbors due to ethnic and economic migration others are indigenous populations who have always lived within this this area and some other cases it's a combination of both all of which again to reiterate makes the depiction of the mongols within this book as they're described as the Han, as the um who dynasty and makes them this depiction uncomfortable in ways which really don't feel like it's on case of authorial intent nor is it uncomfortable in a case of ignorance of Chinese history, ignorance of cultural background. This is a case where, where knowing more and where my having watched and having after an adolescence of being in, engaging with Chinese cinema, particularly action cinema, inspired me to want to learn more about Chinese history and the history of some of China's neighbors and how China's interacted with them by having that knowledge has made the book as makes this book not work as well as it would if I came into it ignorant. That said, like the books where the parts of the book that are uncomfortable, where it's clear that the author is trying wants me to be uncomfortable. The parts involving Chong Ba facing classism, institutional misogyny that they have to try and turn a blind eye to in order to continue to pass as male and so on, those parts work. A book making you uncomfortable isn't bad when that's what when isn't bad when the author is trying to get you to feel uncomfortable when when, when that's the objective. If a book if the author, if authorial intent is to cause you to be discomfort because it's because it is challenging your assumptions or call or similar sorts of things, then that 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 that's the author doing their job well. And the author and and Parker Chan does do her job well, does write a really good book in significant portions of it. It's when the narrative perspective shifts inside the Hugh, the Hugh court. That's where things get bad. That's, that is where it is uncomfortable in ways the author did intend. That is when it's the, that is the case of the, of what feels like as I'm reading it, the author stepping on a rake and not noticing it until it's too late. And again, that's that is a side plot. That's a B plot. Everything with Zhu Ch with Zhu Chongba, the character described in the title, "She Who Became the Sun," is fantastic. It is amazing writing that stands on its own incredibly well. It is only the portions that just focus on the Hugh Imperial Court and the members within it, its internal politics that get deeply problematic and make the book one that I can't fully wholeheartedly recommend. I, I enjoyed significant chunks of it, but this was this. I wanted to love this book more than I did. I don't hate the fact that I read it. I don't think I wasted my time reading it. And again, there are large chunks of it I enjoyed. But it is significant that I my takeaway from this is like I want to go, yeah, I like this book. I want to rank this I want to rank this book higher than Hail Mary. Because Hail Mary felt like extruded hard science fiction product of, of the Hugo nominees that I read. But I can't because the rakes that she who became the sun step on for better or worse are ones that that are avoided by Hail Mary 
admittedly, Hail Barry av avoids them due to lack of ambition. And she who became the son steps on these rakes because of coming from a from a artistically interesting place of seeking to do to do more narrative to emulate a genre and that's where things like as far as ranking these books go ultimately um Night from Uncommon Stars just like that was my that blew me away. That knocked my socks off. That made that that made my that, that that book made my year. That book was a true joy to read. This one again my takeaway from it is, is much more of an eh, which is unfortunate. <laughs> Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe, and also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, Cost me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that. 